Chapter 4 of The Galaxy Primes by E. E. Doc Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Galaxy Primes. Chapter 4 I think I'll come along with you and bodyguard you, Lola, Bell said the following morning after breakfast. Clee's going to be seven thousand miles deep in mathematics, and Jim's doing his stuff at the observatory, and I can't help either of them at the moment. You'd do a better job, wouldn't you, if you could concentrate on it? Of course. Thanks, Bell. But remember, it's already been announced. No death. Just hands. I can't really believe that I'll be attacked, but they seem pretty sure of it. I'd like to separate anyone like that from his head instead of his hands, but as it is published, so it will be performed. How about wearing some kind of halfway comfortable shoes instead of those slippers? Garlock asked. That could turn out to be a long, tough brawl, and your dogs will be begging for mercy before you get back here. Uh uh, very comfortable and a perfect fit. Besides, if I have to suffer just a little bit for a good appearance's sake in the matter of intergalactic amity, a matter of showing off, you mean. Why, Clee! Bell widened her eyes at him. How you talk! But they're ready, Lola. Let's go. The two girls disappeared from the main to appear on the speaker stand in front of the Capitol building. President Benton was there with his cabinet and certain other personages, General Cordine and his staff, and many others. Oh, Miss Bellamy, too? I'm very glad you're here, Benton said as he shook hands cordially with both. Thank you. I came along as bodyguard. May I meet your Secret Service chief, please? Why, of course, Miss Bellamy. May I present Mr. Avangord? You have the hospital room ready? Where is it, please? Back of us, in the wing. Just think of it, please, and I will follow your thought. Ah, yes, there it is. I hope it will not be used. You agree with General Cordine that there will be one or more attempts at assassination? I'm very much afraid so. This town is literally riddled with enemy agents, and, of course, we don't know all of them, especially the best ones. They know that if these meetings go through, they're sunk, so they're desperate. We've got this whole area covered like dew. We've arrested sixteen suspects already this morning. But all the advantage is theirs," Avangord finished glumly. "'Not all of it, sir.' Bell smiled at him cheerfully. You have me, and I am a prime operator. That is, a wielder of power of no small ability. Oh, you are right. There is an attempt now being prepared. While Bell had been greeting and conversing, she had also been scanning. Her range, her sensitivity, and her power were immensely greater than Lola's, were probably equal to Garlock's own. She scanned by miles against the scant yards covered by Secret Service. Where? Give me your thought. The Secret Service man did not know what she meant. Telepathy was, of course, new to him. So she seized his attention and directed it to a certain window in a building a couple of miles away on a hill. But they couldn't from there. But they can. They have a quite efficient engine of destruction. A rifle is their thought. Large and long, with a very good telescope on it, with crosshairs. If I scan their minds more precisely, you may know the weapon. Ah, they think of it as a Buford Mark Forty anti-aircraft rifle. A Buford? My God! They can hit any button on her clothes! Get her away, quick!" He tried to jump, but could not move. "'As you were,' she directed. There was another Buford there, and another over there," she guided his thought. Two men to each Buford. There are now six handless men in your hospital room. If you will send men to those three places, you will find the Bufords and the hands. Your surgeon will have no difficulty in matching the hands to the men. If any seek to remove either Bufords or hands before your men get there, I will de-hand them also." To say that this Secret Service man was flabbergasted is to put it very mildly indeed. Cordine had told him, with much pounding on his desk and in searing, air-bluing language, what to expect, or rather, to expect anything, no matter what and with no limits whatever. But he hadn't believed it then, and simply could not believe it now. 
God damn it, such things couldn't happen. And this beautiful, beautifully stacked, half-naked woman, girl rather, she couldn't be a day over twenty-five, even if it had been their black-browed, top-lofty leader, Captain Garlock himself. I am twenty-three of your years old, not twenty-five, she informed him coldly, and I will permit no distinction of sex. In your primitive culture the women may still be allowing you men to believe in the fallacy of the superiority of the male, but I know right now that I can do anything any man ever born can do, and do it better." Oh, I'm... I'm sure, certainly, Avangor's thought was incoherent. If you want me to work with you, you had better start believing right now that there are a lot of things you don't know," Bell went on relentlessly. Stop believing that just because a thing has not already happened on this primitive, backward, mud-ball planet of yours, it can't happen anywhere or any when. You do believe, however, whether you want to or not, things you see with your own eyes? Yes, I cannot be hypnotized. I'm very glad you believe that much." Avangord did not notice that she neither confirmed nor denied the truth of his statement. To that end, you will go now into the hospital room and see the bandaging going on. You will see and hear the news broadcast going out as I prepared it." He went and came back a badly shaken man. "'But they're setting it out exactly as it happened,' he protested. They'll all scatter out so fast and so far we'll never catch them." By no means. You see, the amputees didn't believe that they would lose their hands. Their superiors didn't believe it either. They assured each other, and their underlings, that it was just capitalistic bluff and nonsense. And since they are all even more materialistic and hidebound and unbelieving than you are, they all are now highly confused, at a complete loss. You can say that again. If I, working with you and having you pounding it into my head, couldn't more than half believe it. So they are now very frightened, as well as confused, and the director of their whole spy system is now violating rule and precedent by sending out messengers to summon certain high agents to confer with him in his secret place. If you tell me where, I'll get over to my office. No, we'll both be in your office in plenty of time. We'll watch Lola get started. It will be highly instructive for you to watch a really capable operator at work." President Benton had been introduced, had in turn finished introducing Lola. The crowd, many thousands strong, was cheering. Lola was stepping into the carefully marked speaker's place. "'You may disconnect these,' she waved a hand at the battery of microphones, "'since I do not use speech. Not only do I not know any of your various languages, but no one language would suffice. My thought will go into every person on this, your world." World? the President asked in surprise. Surely not behind the curtains. They will jam you, I'm afraid. My thought, as I shall drive it, will not be stopped, Lola assured him. Since this world has no telepathy, it has no mind-blocks, and I can cover the planet as easily as one mind. Nor does it matter whether it be day or night, or whether anyone is awake or asleep. All will receive my message. Since you wish a record, the cameras may run, although they are neither necessary nor desirable for me. Everyone will see me in his mind much better than on the surface of any TV tube." And I was going to have her address Congress," the President whispered aside to General Cordine. Then Lola put her whole fine personality into a smile, directed apparently not only at each separate individual within sight, but also individually at every person on the globe. And when Brownie Montandon set out to make a production of a smile, it had the impact of a pile-driver. Then came her smooth, gently flowing, friendly thought. My name, friends of this world, Ormolon, is Lola Montandon. Those of you who are now looking at TV screens can see my imaged likeness. All of you can see me very much better within your own minds. I am not here as an invader in any sense, but only as a citizen of the first galaxy of this, our common universe. I have attuned my mind to each of yours in order to give you a message from the United Galaxian Societies. 
there are four of us Galaxians in this exploration team. As Galaxians, it is our purpose here and our duty here to open your minds to certain basic truths, to be of help to you in clearing your minds of fallacies, of lies, and of undefensible prejudices, to the end that you will more rapidly become Galaxians yourselves. Okay, this will go on and on. That's enough to give you an idea of what a trained and polished performer can do. What do you think of them comfits, chief? Bell deliberately knocked the Secret Service man out of his Lola-induced mood. Huh? Oh, yes. Avangord was still groggy. She's phenomenal. Good. I don't mean goody-goody, but sincere, and really— Yeah, but don't fall in love with her. Everybody does, and it doesn't do any of them a bit of good. That's her specialty, and she's very good at it. I told you she's a smooth, smooth worker. You can say that again. Avangord did not know that he was repeating himself. But it isn't an act. She means it, and it's true. Of course she means it, and of course it's true. Otherwise, even she, with all her training, couldn't sell such a big bill of goods. Then, in answer to the man's unspoken question, Yes, we're all different. She's the contactor, the spreader of the good old oil, the shining example of purity and sweetness and light. In short, the greaser of the ways. I'm a fighter myself. Do you think she could actually have de-handed those men? Uh-uh. At the last minute, she would have weakened and brought them in whole. My job in this operation is to knock the hell out of the ones Lola can't convince, such as those spies you and I are going to interview pretty quick. Even though they ought to be convinced, I don't see how anybody could help but be. Uh-uh. It'll bounce off like hailstones off a tin roof. The only thing to do with that kind of scum is kill them. If you'll give me a thought as to where your office is, we'll hop over and— Bell and Avangord disappeared from the stand, and such was Lola's hold, no one on the platform or in the throng even noticed that they were gone. They materialized in Avangord's private office, he sitting as usual at his desk, she reclining in legs-crossed ease in a big leather chair. Get to work. Bell's thought had not been interrupted by any passage of time whatever. What do you want to do first? But I thought you were covering Miss Montandon. I am, like a blanket. Just as well here as anywhere. I will be, until she gets back to the Pleiades. What first? Oh, well, since I don't know what your limits are, if you have any, you might as well do whatever you think best, and I'll watch you do it. That's the way to talk. You're going to get a shock when you see who the head man is. George T. Basil. Basil? I'll say it's a shock. Avangord steadied, frowned in concentration. Could be, though. He would never be suspected. But they're very good at that. Yeah. His name used to be Baslovkowitz. He was trained for years, then planted. None of this can be proved, as his record is perfect. Born citizen, highest standing in business and social circles, unlimited entry and top security clearance, right? Right. And getting enough evidence, in such cases as that, is pure, unadulterated hell. I suppose I could kill him, after we've recorded everything he knows, Bell suggested. No, he snapped. Too many people think of us as a strong-arm squad now. Anyway, I'd rather kill him myself than wish the job off on to— You don't like killing, do you? That's the understatement of the century. No civilized person does. In a hot fight, yes. But killing anyone who is helpless to fight back, in cold blood, ugh, it makes me sick in my stomach even to think of it. With the way you can read minds, we can get evidence enough to send them all to jail, and that will have to do. How about this? Bell grinned as another solution came to mind. From those first eight top men, we'll find out a lot of others lower down, and so on, until we have them all locked up here. We'll announce that exactly so many spies and agents, giving names, addresses, and facts, of course, got panicky after Lola's address. They fired up their hidden planes and flew back behind the curtain. 
Then, when we've scanned their minds and recorded everything you want, I'll pack them all, very snugly and carefully, into Sovig's private office. With the world situation what it then will be, he won't dare kill them. He simply won't know what to do when faced with it." Avangord agreed happily. He reached out and flipped the switch of his intercom. "'Miss Kimling, come in, please.' The door burst open. "'Why, it is you! But you were on the rostrum just a minute. Oh!' She saw Bell and backed, eyes wide, toward the door she had just entered. She was there, too, and it's fifteen miles. Steady, Fram. I'd like to present you to Prime Operator Bell Bellamy, who is cleaning out the entire curtain organization for us. But how did you— Never mind that. Teleportation. It took her half an hour to pound it into me, and we can't take time to explain anything now. I'll tell everybody everything I know as soon as I can. In the meantime, don't be surprised at anything that happens, and by that I mean anything, such as solid people appearing on this carpet, on that spot right there, instantaneously. I want you to pay close attention to everything your mind receives, put your phenomenal memory into high gear, listen to everything I record, stop me any time I'm wrong, and be sure I get everything we need. I don't know exactly what you're talking about, sir but I'll try. Frankly, I don't either. We'll just have to roll it as we go along. We're ready for George T. Basil now, Miss Bellamy, I hope. Don't jump, Fram." Basil appeared, and Fram jumped. She did not scream, however, and did not run out of the office. The master spy was a big, self-assured, affluent type. He had not the slightest idea of how he had been spirited out of his ultra-secret sub-basement and into this room, but he knew where he was, and, after one glance at Bell, he knew why. He decided instantly what to do about it. "'This is an outrage!' he bellowed, hammering with his fist on Avangord's desk. "'A stupid, high-handed violation of the rights!' Bell silenced him and straightened him up. "'High-handed?' Yes," she admitted quite seriously. However, from the Galaxian standpoint, you have no rights at all, and you are going to be extremely surprised at just how high-handed I am going to be. I am going to read your mind to its very bottom, layer by layer, like peeling an onion, and everything you know and everything you think is going down in Mr. Avangord's big black book." Bell linked all four minds together and directed the search making sure that no item, however small, was missed. Avangord recorded every pertinent item. Fram Kimling memorized and correlated and double-checked. Soon it was done, and Basil, shouting even louder about this last and worst violation of his rights, those of his own private mind, was led away by two men and put away where he would keep. But this is a flagrant violation of law. Miss Kimling began. "'You can say that again,' her boss gloated. "'And if you only knew how tickled I am to do it, after the way they've been kicking me around—' "'But I wonder, are you sure we can get away with it?' "'Certainly,' Bell put in. "'We Galaxians are doing it, not your government or your secret service. We'll start you clean, but it'll be up to you to keep it clean, and that will be no easy job.' No, it won't, but we'll do it. Come around again, say, in five or six years, and see. You know, I might take you up on that. Maybe not this same team, but I've got a notion to tape a recommendation for a revisit, just to see how you get along. It'd be interesting. I wish you would. It might help, too, if everybody thought you'd come back to check. Suppose you could? I've no idea, really. I'd like to, though, and I'll see what I can do. But let's get on with the job. They're all in what you call the tank now. Which one do you want next?" The work went on. That evening there was, of course, a reception, and then a ball. And Belle's feet did hurt when she got back to the Pleiades, but, of course, she would not admit the fact, and most especially not to Garlock. Exactly at the expiration of the stipulated seventy-two hours, 
the Galaxians began to destroy military atomic plants, and shortly thereafter the starship's crew was again ready to go. And James rammed home the red button that would send them, all four wondered, where. It turned out to be another Hodel-type world, and even with the high-speed comparator it took longer to check the charts than it did to make them. The next planet was similar. So was the next and the next. The time required for checking grew longer and longer. "'How about cutting out this checking entirely, Clee?' James asked then. "'What good does it do? Even if we find a similarity, what could we do about it? We've got enough stuff now to keep a crew of astronomers busy for five years making a tank of it.' Okay. We probably are so far away now anyway that the chance of finding a similarity is vanishingly small. Keep on taking the shots, though. They'll prove, I think, that the universe is one whole hell of a lot bigger than anybody has ever thought it was. That reminds me. Are you getting anywhere on that end problem? I'm not. I'm getting nowhere fast. You should have been a math prof in grad school, Clee. You could flunk every advanced student you had with that one. Bell and I together can't feed it into copy in such shape as to get a definite answer. We think, though, that your guess was right. If we ever stabilize anywhere, it will probably be relative to Hodel, not to tell us. But the cold fact of how far away we must be by this time just scares the pants off me. You and me both, my ripe and old. We're a long ways from home." Jumping went on, and two or three planets later they encountered an Arpalone inspector who did not test them for compatibility with the humanity of his world. "'Do not land,' the creature said mournfully. "'This world is dying, and if you leave the protection of your ship you too will die.' "'But worlds don't die, surely,' Garlock protested. People, yes, but worlds? Worlds die. It is the Dilipic. The humans die, too, of course, but it is the world itself that is attacked, not the people. Some of them, in fact, will live through it. Garlock drove his attention downward and scanned. You Arpalones are doing what looks like a mighty good job of fighting. Can't you win? No, it is too late. It was already too late when they first appeared two days ago. When the Dilipic strike in such small force that none of their agents, devices, whatever they are, can land against our beaming, a world can be saved, but such cases are very few. But this thought, Dilipic, Garlock asked impatiently, it is merely a symbol. It doesn't mean anything, to me at least. What are they? Where do they come from? No one knows anything about them," came the surprising answer. Not even their physical shape, if they have any, nor where they come from, or how they do what they do. They can't be very common, Garlock pondered. We have never heard of them before. Fortunately, they are not, the inspector agreed. Scarcely one world in five hundred is ever attacked by them. This is the first Dilipic invasion I have seen." "'Oh, you Arpalones don't die with your worlds, then?' Lola asked. She was badly shaken. "'But I suppose the Arpales do, of course.' "'Practically all of the Arpales will die, of course. Most of us Arpalones will also die in the battles now going on. Those of us who survive, however, We'll stay aloft until the rehabilitation fleet arrives, then we will continue our regular work." "'Rehab?' Bell exclaimed. "'You mean you can restore planets so badly ruined that all the people die?' "'Oh, yes. It is a long and difficult work, but the planet is always repeopled.' "'Let's go down,' Garlock said. "'I want to get all of this on tape.' They went down over what had been one of that world's largest cities. The air, the stratosphere, and all nearby space were full of battling vessels of all shapes and sizes, ranging from the tremendous globular spaceships of the invaders down to the tiny one-man jet fighters of the Arpalones. 
the Dilipics were using projectile weapons only, ranging in size with the size of the vessels, from heavy machine guns up to seventy-five millimeter quick-firing rifles. They were also launching thousands of guided missiles of fantastic speed and of tremendous explosive power. The Arpalones were not using anything solid at all. Each defending vessel, depending upon its type and class, carried from four up to a hundred or so burnished metal reflectors some four feet in diameter, each with a small black device at its optical center and each pouring out a tight beam of highly effective energy. It was at these reflectors, and particularly at these tiny devices, that the small arms fire was directed, and the marksmanship of the Dilipics was very good indeed. However, each projector was oscillating irregularly, and each fighter plane was taking evasive action. And since a few bullet holes in any reflector did not reduce its efficiency very much, and since the central mechanisms were so small and were moving so erratically, a good three-quarters of the Arpolonian beams were still in action. There was no doubt at all that those beams were highly effective. Invisible for the most part, whenever one struck a Delipic ship or plane everything in its path flared almost instantly into vapor, and the beam glared incandescently, blindingly white or violet or high blue, never anything lower than blue. Almost everything material, that is, for guns, ammunition, and missiles were not affected. They did not even explode. When whatever fabric it was that supported them was blasted away, all such things simply dropped, simply fell through thousands or hundreds of thousands of feet of air to crash unheeded upon whatever happened to be below. The invading task force was arranged in a whirling, swirling, almost cylindrical cone, more or less like an earthly tornado. The largest vessels were high above the stratosphere. The smallest fighters were hedge-hoppingly close to the ground. Each Dilipic unit seemed madly, suicidally determined that nothing would get through that furious wall to interfere with whatever it was that was coming down from space to the ground through, along, the relatively quiet eye of the pseudo-hurricane. On the other hand, the Arpalones were madly, suicidally determined to break through that vortex wall, to get into the eye, to wreak all possible damage there. Group after group after group of five jet fighters each came driving in, and occasionally the combined blasts of all five made enough of an opening in the wall so that the center fighter could get through. Once inside, each pilot stood his little, stubby-winged craft squarely on her tail, opened his projectors to absolute maximum of power and of spread, and climbed straight up the spout until he was shot down. And the Arpalones were winning the battle. Larger and larger gaps were being opened in the vortex wall, gaps which it became increasingly difficult for the Dilipics to fill. More and more Arpalone fighters were getting inside. They were lasting longer and doing more damage all the time. The tube was growing narrower and narrower. All four Galaxians perceived all this in seconds. Garlock weighed out and detonated a terrific matter conversion bomb in the exact center of one of the largest vessels of the attacking fleet. It had no effect. Then a larger one. Then another, still heavier. Finally, at over a hundred megatons equivalent, he did get results, of a sort. The invaders' guns, ammunition, and missiles were blown out of the ship and scattered outward for miles in all directions, but the structure of the Dilipic ship itself was not harmed. Bell had been studying, analyzing, probing the things that were coming down through that hellish tube. Clee! she drove a thought. Cut out the monkey business with those damn firecrackers of yours and look here. Pure solid force like ball lightning, or our op field, but entirely different. See if you can analyze the stuff." "'Alive?' Garlock asked, as he drove a probe into one of the things. They were furiously radiating spheres some seven feet in diameter, and began to tune to it. "'I don't know. Don't think so. If they are, they're a form of life that no sane human being could even imagine. Let's see what they actually do. Garlock suggested, 
still trying to tune in with the thing, whatever it was, and still following it down. This particular force ball happened to hit the top of a six-story building. It was not going very fast, fifteen or twenty miles an hour, but when it struck the roof it did not even slow down. Without any effort at all, apparently, it continued downward through the concrete and steel and glass of the building, and everything in its path became monstrously, sickeningly, revoltingly changed. "'I simply can't stand any more of this,' Lola gasped. "'If you don't mind, I'm going to my room, set all the Gunther blocks it has, and bury my head under a pillow.' "'Go ahead, Brownie,' James said. "'This is too tough for anybody to watch. I'd do the same, except I've got to run these cameras.' Lola disappeared. Garlock and Bell kept on studying. Neither had paid any attention at all to either Lola or James. Instead of the structural material it had once been, the board that the thing had traversed was now full of a sparkling, bubbling, writhing, partly fluid, partly viscous, obscenely repulsive mass of something unknown and unknowable on earth, a something which Garlock now recalled had been thought of by the Arpalone inspector as Gollop. As that unstoppable globe descended through office after office, it neither sought out people nor avoided them. Walls, doors, windows, ceilings, floors, and rugs, office furniture and office personnel, all alike were absorbed into and made a part of that indescribably horrid brew. Nor did the track of that hellishly wanton globe remain a bore. Instead, it spread. That devil's brew ate into and dissolved everything it touched, like a stream of boiling water being poured into a loosely heaped pile of granulated sugar. By the time the ravening sphere had reached the second floor, the entire roof of the building was gone, and the writhing, racing flood of corruption had flowed down the outer walls and across the street, engulfing and transforming sidewalks, people, pavement, poles, wires, automobiles, people, anything and everything it touched. The globe went on down, through basement and sub-basement, until it reached solid, natural ground. Then, with its top a few inches below the level of natural ground, it came to a full stop and, apparently, did nothing at all. By this time the ravening flood outside had eaten far into the lower floors of the buildings across the street, as well as along all four sides of the block, and tremendous masses of masonry and steel, their supporting structures devoured, were subsiding, crumbling, and crashing down into the noisome flood of Gollop, and were being transformed almost as fast as they could fall. One tremendous mass, weighing hundreds or perhaps thousands of tons, toppled almost as a whole, splashing the stuff in all directions for hundreds of yards. Wherever each splash struck, however, a new center of attack came into being, and the peculiarly disgusting, abhorrent liquidation went on. "'Can you do anything with it, Clee?' Bell demanded. "'Not too much. It's a mess,' Garlock replied. "'Besides, it wouldn't get us far, I don't think.' It'll be more productive to analyze the beams the Arpalones are using to break them up, don't you think?" Then, for twenty solid minutes, the two prime operators worked on those enigmatic beams. "'We can't assemble that kind of stuff with our minds,' Bell decided then. "'I'll say we can't,' Garlock agreed. Ten megacycles, and cycling only twenty per second. He whistled raucously through his teeth. My guess is it'd take four months to design and build a generator to put out that kind of stuff. It's worse than our upfield. I'm not sure I could ever design one, Bell said thoughtfully. But, of course, I'm not the engineer you are. Then she could not help adding, yet. No, and you never will be, he said flatly. No, that's what you think. Even in such circumstances as those, Belle Bellamy was eager to carry on her warfare with her project chief. "'That's exactly what I think. And I'm so close to knowing it for a fact that the difference is indetectable.' Belle almost, but not quite, blew up. "'Well, what are you going to do?' 
unless and until I can figure out something effective to do, I'm not going to try to do anything. If you, with your vaunted and flaunted belief in the inherent superiority of the female over the male, can dope out something useful before I do, I'll eat crow and help you do it. As for arguing with you, I'm all done for the moment." Bell gritted her teeth, flounced away, and plumped herself down into a chair. She shut her eyes and put every iota of her mind to work on the problem of finding something, anything, that could be done to help this doomed world, and to show that big, overbearing jerk of a garlock that she was a better man than he was. Which of the two objectives loomed more important she herself could not have told to save her life. And Garlock looked around. The air and the sky over the now-vanished city were both clear of delipic craft. The surviving Arpalone fighters and other small craft were making no attempt to land, anywhere on the world's surface. Instead, they were flying upward, toward, and were being drawn one by one into the bowels of huge Arpalonian space freighters. When each such vessel was filled to capacity, it flew upward and set itself into a more or less circular orbit around the planet. Around and around and around the ruined world the Pleiades went, recording, observing, charting. Fifty-eight of those atrocious delipic vortices had been driven to ground. Every large landmass surrounded by large bodies of water had been struck once, and only once. From the tremendous area of the largest continent down to the relatively tiny expanses of the largest islands. One land mass, one vortex, one only. What do you suppose that means? James asked. Afraid of water? Damn if I know. Could be. Let's check mountains, too. Skip us back to where we started. Oceans and mountains both fairly close there. The city had disappeared long since. For hundreds of almost level square miles there extended a sparkling, seething, writhing expanse of... of what? The edge of that devouring flood had almost reached the foothills, and over that gnawing, dissolving edge the Pleiades paused. Small lakes and ordinary rivers bothered the gallop very little, if at all. There was perhaps a slightly increased sparkling, a slight stiffening, a little darkening, some freezing and breaking off of solid blocks. But the thing's forward motion was not noticeably slowed down. It drank a fairly large river and a lake one mile wide by ten miles long while the two men watched. The gallop made no attempt to climb either foothills or mountains. It leveled them. It ate into their bases at its own level the undermined masses, small and large, collapsed into the foul, corrosive semi-liquid and were consumed. Nor was there much raising of the gallop's level, even when the highest mountains were reached and miles-high masses of solid rock broke off and toppled. There was some raising, of course, but the stuff was fluid enough so that its slope was not apparent to the eye. Then the Pleiades went back, over the place where the city had been, and on to what had once been an ocean beach. The original wave of degradation had reached that shore long since, had attacked its sands out into deep water, and there it had been stopped. The corrupt flood was now being reinforced, however, by an ever-rising tide of material that had once been mountains. And the slope, which had not been even noticeable at the mountains or over the plain, was here very evident. As the rapidly flowing gallop struck water, the water shivered, came to a weirdly unforgettable cold boil, and exploded into drops and streamers and jagged-edged chunks of something that was neither water nor land, or rock or soil or sand or Satan's unholy brew. Nevertheless, the water won. There was so much of it. Each barrel of water that was destroyed was replaced instantly and enthusiastically, with no lowering of level or of pressure. And when the water struck the gallop, the gallop also shivered violently, then sparkled even more violently, then stopped sparkling and turned dark, then froze solid. The frozen surface, however, was neither thick enough nor strong enough to form an effective wall. Again and again, the wave of gallop built up high enough to crack and to shatter that feeble wall, 
Again and again Gollop and Water met in ultimately furious, if insensate, battle. Inch by inch the ocean shoreline was driven backward toward ocean's depths, but every inch the ocean lost was to its tactical advantage, since the advancing front was by now practically filled with hard, solid, dead blocks of its own substance, which it could neither assimilate nor remove from the scene of conflict. Hence the wall grew ever thicker and solider, the advance became slower and slower. Then, finally, ocean waves of ever-increasing height and violence rolled in against the new-formed shore. What caused those tremendous waves, earthquakes perhaps due to the shifting of the mountain's masses, no Tellurian ever surely knew. Whatever the cause, however, those waves operated to pin the gallop down. Whenever and wherever one of those monstrous waves white-capped in, hurling hundreds of thousands of tons of water inland for hundreds of yards, the battlefront stabilized then and there. All over that world the story was the same. Wherever there was water enough, the water won, and the total quantity of water in that world's oceans remained practically unchanged. "'Good! A lot of people escaped!' James said, expelling a long-held breath. Everybody who lives on, or could be flown to all the islands smaller than the biggest ones, if they can find enough to eat, and if the air isn't poisoned. Air's okay, so's the water, and they'll get food, Garlock said. The Arpalones will handle things, including distribution. What I'm thinking about is how they're going to rehabilitate it. That, as an engineering project, is a feat to end all feats. Brother! You can play that in spades," James agreed. Except that it'll take too many months before they can even start the job, I'd like to stick around and see how they go about it. How does this kind of stuff fit into that theory you're not admitting is a theory? Not worth a damn. However, it's a datum, and, as I've said before and may say again, if we can get enough data we can build a theory out of it. Then it began to rain. For many minutes the clouds had been piling up, black, far-flung, thick and high. Immense bolts of lightning flashed and snapped and crackled. Thunder crashed and rolled and rumbled. Rain fell and continued to fall, like a cloudburst in Colorado. And shortly thereafter, first by square feet and then by acres and then by square miles, the surface of the gallop began to die. To die, that is if it had ever been even partially alive. At least it stopped sparkling, darkened, and froze into thick skins, which broke up into blocks, which in turn sank, thus exposing an ever-renewed surface to the driving, pelting, relentlessly cascading rain. "'Well, I don't know that there's anything to hold us here any longer,' Garlock said finally. "'Shall we go?' They went but it was several days before any of the wanderers really felt like smiling, and Lola did not recover from her depression for over a week. End of chapter 4